Um, I want to acknowledge my co-authors because they're the ones that are doing this work. Um, Adam Forsberg, who's a graduate student at the University of Georgia with David Radcliffe. John Ramirez, actually it's Alvarez Ramirez at Mississippi State University. Dan Storm and Aaron Middlestead at Oklahoma State and Carl Bolst Bolster at ARS. They're the brains behind this. So um, I just want to say something about this project. Um, Andrew introduced it. This project is completely unique in that we have three groups across the country working on the same problem, coming at, at it from different angles, and then at the end of the day, somehow we're going to try and put it together. I think this is the way projects science needs to go for us to really start answering some of these hard projects. So that's just my um, philosophy about this particular work that we're doing. So Andrew alluded to this. Uh, we've done two papers now, and you're going to see some other work. We've been working in the South for over 10 years, looking to see how well our phosphorus indices do with the same data across state boundaries. Now, you probably all know that in the South, we're, a, we're real strong proponents of states' rights, and the phosphorus index is no exception. Every single state in the South developed their own phosphorus index in isolation without talking to the other states. So it's not a surprise that we come up with different answers. Um, I just want to show you what we're talking about in the South. Um, New Mexico used to be part of us, but they got dropped off. Virginia should be part of us, but they're in the Chesapeake Bay. So when I refer to the Southern CIG, these are the states that I'm talking about. And you can see that it is a really diverse agroecological region. Even Texas, if you just take Texas, it's really diverse. But going across, is uh, we've got lots of different systems. So Pete set me up perfect for the objectives of our proposal because he showed that great diagram of the data accumulation and the modeling. And that's what we're doing, too. We're trying to find these data sets, and as Andrew said, and Peter said, it's been harder than we thought. Not only has it been harder to identify them, but once we identified them, we have spent months just getting the data together. Um, and then we wanted to look at the fate, these fate and transport models. And we're looking at Apex, TBIT, and Apple. We'd hoped to include DrainMod, which was developed in North Carolina, but unfortunately, that's not working out for us. So we're looking at those models relative to water quality data. OK. So these are the data that we identified. There was a lot more data in Oklahoma and Texas. But what we wanted to do was pull four data sets from each of those states that had kind of diverse um, agricultural conditions. We got, we were able to find sites throughout the South that represent the majority of the agroecosystems in the South with the exception of Florida. These are the field sites that we're working with. Um, we have a number of different site years. Some of these are truly plot scale. Some of these are small watershed scale. Um, and they have different, mainly three phosphorus ranging from about 450 to a low of 10. In some instances, there's only one soil series um, for the entire experimental unit, such as um, in Arkansas, but in Georgia, they had four soil series with two different hydrologic groupings. So th this is the generalized data set, the land use information that goes into running the models that I'm going to talk about. So let me just start. Um, we are using TBIT, to, which has SWAT behind the scenes um, for some of the uh, sites that I've just showed you. I want to say something that's really important, because Pete just set me up perfect, even though we hadn't seen each other's presentations for my presentations. The version of SWAT that's running in TPIT has the old phosphorus routines. So we already know that those old phosphorus routines aren't working as well as they should be, and so the information that I'm going to show you has the older routines. These are the types of information that we have to obtain. Um, and again, it's not as trivial as it seems, uh, seems trying to find this land use and climate data. 
When you look at the data I'm going to present today on TBIT, we calibrated TBIT for our runs. And there's some modeling stuff in here that I don't understand. So for those of you that are modelers, we did a two-year warm-up. As a group, we had to spend a lot of time determining how we were going to run the models so that we were all running them the same way. Because even things like warm-up time can vary between modelers. And then we compared the model predictions um, to the measured values on event basis, but then also summing for annual. And we only looked at runoff data that was 0.1 millimeters or greater. M my modeling colleagues have lots of conversations about the statistics one should use. And when they have these conversations, my eyes kind of glaze over. Um, and they are looking typically at R squares, Nash Sutcliffe, and percent bias. Dave Radcliffe prefers Nash Sutcliffe, and I think Carl does too. But because this isn't my world, we're going to talk about R-squared today in the presentation. So this work um, that I'm going to show you, um, Georgia, North Carolina, Mississippi, and Arkansas was done by the Georgia group, particularly Adam, the graduate student, and Texas and Oklahoma by, the Dan, by Dan Storm's group. Blue is Georgia, green is North Carolina, red is Mississippi, Texas, Oklahoma, I think is purple, and Arkansas is yellow. There's a, let me see if I can get this pointer to work. Um, this is the one-to-one one -one line, so that if there's absolute correspondence between the simulated runoff and the observed runoff, the points would fall along this line. But the relationship is not bad, and the line is pretty close. It has an overall R squared of a little over 0.7. And um, so for runoff, our simulated results and our observed results in the calibrated T-bit were pretty close. However, for the individual, individual runs, some of them were really good, like Mississippi and Arkansas, and others such as Georgia or less well. But again, it's pretty good, but it is calibrated. And that's really important when we're talking about field scale phosphorus indices. However, the minute that we get to sediment, things start falling apart. Um, we don't have sediment in here from Georgia because those were pasture-based systems and they never measured any sediment. So the R-square here is rather poor for the overall data set. The R squared for um, Mississippi is pretty good, but the rest of the locations, it's not so good. So for the most part, we're over predicting sediment. Not surprisingly, because we're pr over predicting sediment, we're also over predicting phosphorus. Again, a poor R squared for all of the data set. But when we look at individual data, um, it typically is really poor to uh, somewhat squishy okay. So observed uh, total phosphorus is not working too well in this model. When we get to dissolved, it's actually working um, better than total P. Here we're overestimating the dissolved phosphorus relative to the simulated dissolved phosphorus. The overall R square is a, uh, about 0.5. Some of the locations, we see a very good relationship between simulated dissolved phosphorus and observed dissolved phosphorus. Other locations, uh, the data are not as well correlated. So in concluding for TBIT, runoff predictions, although slightly greater, um, were um, satisfactory. However, phosphorus is our major interest. So when we look at sediment, TP, and dissolved phosphorus, the model starts falling apart. And that's really important. Um, the thing that we did not appreciate was how long it was going to take to do the modeling. I think, <laughs> I think Pete referred to that, how long it was going to take to get the data set. Again, this is really important when you're thinking about trying to run these tools in a field-based situation. So the next model that we're looking at, and John Alvarez Ramirez is doing this work out of Mississippi, was APEX. 
Now, APEX was designed to work at the field scale. This is the model that the Heartland region is using the most. It requires more information than SWAT, and oftentimes the information required to run it was not available in the land use data sets for the experiments, experimental data that we were able to capture in our um, different locations across the south. Um, so I'm gonna, the data is set up slightly different than it was previously. First we're gonna look at Georgia results, then we're gonna look at North Carolina results. Um, John is doing this work for uh, Arkansas as we speak, and it's really important to recognize that he is running an uncalibrated apex. He took it out of the box, um, Andrew talked about this for the Heartland group, set the con set the, put the settings where he thought they should be, and that's the blue dots. He then also used the out of the box setting for the Heartland group, but that's not so important for this discussion. So we're just going to look at the blue dots. And he has a one-to-one -one line. The R square for uh, flow, for total P, and for dissolved P from Georgia were not great. Um, the R squared um, for flow was 0.25. The other ones, there, there was absolutely nothing there. And so there was poor correlation and performance when he looked at the Georgia data. Let me just say that after he does the uncorre, um, he does the, um, after he looks at these three sets of data, he's then gonna go to a calibrated model and see how well that works. Things were a little bit better in North Carolina when he looked at flow, soil loss, total and dissolved phosphorus, except for dissolved phosphorus. He has an R square of almost 0.8 for flow. For soil loss, it was not quite as good, 0.4. For total phosphorus, a little bit better than soil loss, 0.5. But for dissolved phosphorus, there's no relationship. So not quite as bad as the um, Georgia results, but not real great either. So these are his preliminary uh, conclusions. It really was inaccurate when it came to phosphorus loss assessments. The other issue with APEX, for those of the EU that know it and for those of you that don't, it has a lot of different tillage choices that you can use. And oftentimes, uh, we don't even have the information. It required a phenomenal amount of information that we didn't have. And so he thinks that's part of the reason that it didn't perform very well. But again, this is, and I just want to keep, we're going to keep reiterating this. I, between John and Pete and I, you're going to be really sick of this by the time we're done. This is taking lots of time and work that we never expected. Um, it's just very time consuming. So um, the Apple model has been referred to. This was developed by Pete Vadas. It's so user friendly that even I can use this tool, which is phenomenal. Um, it requires runoff and erosion, however, so you need to pull that information from some place. And, and the good thing about this is it doesn't require calibration. I think the routines that, are be, that have been implemented into SWAT for phosphorus came out of Apple. They're Pete's uh, routines, and so he has the latest phosphorus routines in Apple, and that's one of the advantages. Now, Carl Bolster has been doing this work for us. Um, we've got several steps more to go beyond what I'm gonna show you here. And, um, but right now, he's using it. Clearly, it's uncalibrated. He is pulling in the erosion and runoff values from TBIT. So clearly, if those values aren't working too well, it may cause problems down the road. And then he's uh, uh, summing for annual comparisons. Like the Georgia group, he's using these three different statistics of comparison, but again, because of the way I think, we're just gonna look at R squared. But you can see all of the other measures um, in the data tables that Carl has provided. So there are only two uh, parameters that we're gonna look at, total phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus, set up just like all the other graphs with predicted total phosphorus on the y-axis and measured total phosphorus on the uh, x-axis. If you pulled a one-to-one um, -one slope, 
it, it would be more out here. And the R square for the overall runs of observed and predicted were fairly low, 0.2. But like many of the other um, models, Mississippi did pretty well, whereas uh, states like Georgia did less well. And then when he went on to dissolve phosphorus, um, again, the overall R squared is better, just like it was in TBIT. Total P was worse. Um, dissolved phosphorus was better. And again, some of the states had much better relationships. Uh, this had a lot of animal waste applied to it. And some of the states, like North Carolina, had absolutely uh, poor results. And so his preliminary conclusions is this is a great tool to run because it's uncalibrated. And, but you do have to pull your runoff and erosion. And that makes a difference as to how well your results are going to be. And dissolved phosphorus was better than total. All right, so right now we still have a lot more to do on this project, but when we're looking at our models, um, not surprisingly, this is always true of any modeling data I've looked at, flow is always better predicted than sediment, total P, or dissolved P. But this, the last bullet is our most important bullet, is this is way more time consuming than any of us ever thought, and it's not clear to us that these models are going to be appropriate for field-based um, exercises. So I really need to thank our sponsor, NRCS. Again, I think this is a really unique way to do a project and really the way projects should be done in the future.